Hello, welcome back to our bookshop in Tring. I'm Ben Morehouse. So we've got another author interview and we're talking to Jenny Murray, a good friend of ours. Uh, she came in November uh, to talk about the history of the world in 21 Women. This is our number two bestseller in our bookshop and uh, principally because she was such a hit at the uh, festival. Uh, she has since written another book, uh, Fat Cow, Fat Chance, uh, The Science and Psychology of Size. And it's a very honest book and uh, de demonstrates the struggle she's had throughout her life. She's talking to Felicity Hindmarsh. Hi. Thank you, Ben. Um, hello, Jenny. It's so nice to see you again. Hello, Felicity. Nice to see you too. It's been such different. a long time since we've and very different circumstances, I have to say. Absolutely. Zoom, <laughs> zoom, <Yeah>. zoom. <laughs> you look very well. Thank you. We're here today to discuss your new book, um, Fat Cow, Fat Chance, The Science and Psychology of Size. And I have to say that I found it frank, um, brave, um, and very personal. But I also found it informative. And, um, and also ultimately hopeful. Um, in this time of lockdown, I think a lot of us will have struggled terribly with eating and drinking. I know it's been the main topic of conversation in our, in our house. And I think this is the perfect read for people who have actually been struggling with their weight because it offers encouragement and, and comfort. But when you wrote it, it must have been a bit of a roller coaster of emotions, and I wonder to what extent it, it was a catharsis for you. No, not at all. I mean, I've been there, done that, got the t shirt. Um, I just wanted to share what has been a ghastly series of experiences, but mostly the understanding of what obesity is all about because the science has made it so much clearer in the past few years and at last we have a prime minister who has learned how dangerous obesity can be he had a rather nasty experience in the intensive care unit of a covid19 ward and realized his obesity had probably contributed to it and he's now coming around to saying we have to do something about this not just making sure that, you know, there's not so much sugar and salt in pre-prepared foods and try and get people to be careful so that they don't become obese in the first place. But also saying for the first time from a really senior politician, we have to start improving our surgical interventions into what is a disease. Yeah, I mean, I wondered, I put a question for a little bit later, but you know, you brought it up now, so I'll bring it up now. And that is when your Professor Rubino, who sounded an absolutely amazing guy, um, I presume it's a guy, yes, it is, isn't it? Yeah. It is. Um, yeah. Um, when he confirmed to you that body weight is tied into hormones and genetics and not simply energy in, energy out, that obesity is not due to greed or lack of willpower. How did you feel when he did that? I was really rather relieved, as you can imagine. You know, I, I've called this book, it's a very strong title, Fat Cow, Fat Chance. And Fat Cow is because so many times I would be walking down the street or sitting in my little mini, pulling up to the traffic lights, ready to pull away. And some bloke, it was always a bloke or a group of blokes, would just look at me and say, fat cow, or fat, you know, worse words than cow, or who has all the pies, or oh, I wouldn't go there, would you? And I was at a conference, which was arranged by Professor Rubino, when a young, I call them metabolic surgeons, I don't call them bariatric surgeons because it's the metabolism that, that's really significant in this. A young Irish guy stood up and he said, isn't it interesting? He said, you know, we have legislation to cover hate speech and it covers sexuality, gender, race, disability, and he trotted 
all the things that were included often. He said, and have you noticed what it doesn't include? And this whole audience of people who are involved in the treatment of obesity or suffer from obesity all went, oh my goodness, of course, obesity. It's not included in hate speech. Why is it okay for people to walk down the street and call me a fat cow? So that's another of the reasons I wanted to get this message out. We have got to stop shaming people and understand why. Some of us can eat a whole bowl of chips and not put on an ounce. People like me can look at one chip and put on a stone. Yeah, I'm one of those people too, Jenny. And I'm also one of the people that you mention in your book that finds using words obese and fat really quite difficult. Um, it induces in me similar feelings to the, what you said in your book. I feel shame, I feel um, embarrassment um, and sadness. But by the end of the book, I was feeling less so. And what did dawned on me, and I wonder whether you would agree with this, is do you think that it's important that we have ownership of these words? Because maybe it's going to help disarm those fat shamers, the cruel fat shamers out there, if we take back those words and use them as they should be used. I am not in the body positivity movement at okay. all. Um, and the reason I'm not, you know, I have every sympathy for anybody who goes through what I went through. I got to 24 stone, which is ridiculous. Um, but I, I look at these women and I think, yeah, you know, I want you to be fat and happy. I want you to be positive about your body. But hang on, listen to what I learned as a result of getting to such an enormous weight. Mm. And I was in my early 60s and I had had breast cancer, which I have no doubt my obesity played into. I had to have both my hips replaced, which, yeah, was partly a, a result of chemotherapy after I would had the, the breast cancer. Um, but it was also partly because of my obesity. And then at the age of 64, I am lumbering, and that's the only word I can choose, through the park with my three little dogs and my youngest son, who would, would have never fat shamed me. He just would not have done that. But we sat on a bench, which we did frequently on account of me needing to sit on the bench frequently. And we saw a woman go past us who was even bigger than I was on a mobility motorcycle with her two little dogs trotting along beside her with their leads attached to her handlebars. And Charlie looked at her and he looked at me and he said, Mom, you know, I am so worried because if you don't do something about your weight, that's going to be you before very long and you're not going to like it. And can you one of my dogs barking in the background? She obviously heard me say the words dogs and park. And thought, oh, yeah, okay, come on, let's go. Uh, do you know what I'm going to do? I'm just going to go and get her and sit her on my lap. That's fine. That's absolutely fine. Oh. And here she is. And this is, is this Madge? Oh, my little madam. <laughs> <laughs> this is Madge. Yeah, Madge. Um, I, I'm it, can we go back to the beginning just briefly because I was amazed by the detail you could remember of the meals you had when you were a child I mean they were incredible detail you went to um, and I, I was fascinating and it rang bells for me a lot of the things you said I'd forgotten but hearing you speak, you know write about them they all came back things like the lily pond jelly with fanny craddock we had that um also the mantra never refuse always finish um and always say it's lovely thank you for my lovely dinner please may i leave the table so on now you managed you and your husband managed to break the mold break that history and don't not do that again with your boys I have to admit, Jenny, that I didn't. I did repeat history. Now, I wondered, 
Um, when I have grandchildren, if I am blessed with grandchildren, I will do things differently. And I wondered, when your grandchildren come along, is there anything you want to do differently? Or well, they won't get chocolates every time I come round, that's for sure. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I had to, I, I mean, I have no doubt that part of my problem was genetic. I had two grandmas who actually used to laugh about being as round as they were long because they were very short and they were very, very fat. And the whole concept of the treat was something that was very important to them. Mm. So whenever they came around, they brought treats and the treats were always chocolate. And of course, we have to remember that those women, my, my mother and my grandmother, who were the great cooks in my life, were women who'd come through the rationing diet of the Second World War. Rationing was just beginning to end when I was born in 1950, and I was a, you know, I was quite a big baby. I wasn't fat, but uh, I had my father's bone structure rather than my <laughs> mother's, which was a little sad. Um, <clears throat> But they were suddenly beginning to discover that they could get all the lovely things that made delicious meals and sweet puddings. And, and their pride, because they both had to leave their jobs when they married and had children, as people did in those days. My granny worked in a, a mill in Yorkshire in the offices. My mother was a civil servant. Uh, women were not allowed to work at that time they had to make their housekeeping an absolute full-time job so the house was immaculate and the food was amazing because they shopped fresh every day wow. my grandfather grew most of the vegetables and quite a lot of the fruit so everything we ate was fresh and quite healthy and i didn't become fat as a child, even though I did eat more than I really wanted to eat. And I think that's where one of the problems was laid down, right. that I never learned to control my appetite. Mm -hmm. There'd be a huge, great plate of food and there'd be pudding after it. Yes. And yes. Even then I knew the Susie Orbach thing, even mm -hmm. though she hadn't yet written it, you know, listen to your appetite, mm -hmm. eat when you're hungry, when you're full, stop. And I used to try to stop. And my mother would say, oh, come on. I spent all morning making that for you. You've got to eat it all. And if you don't eat it now, you'll eat it tonight. It'll still be there on the plate. Mm -hmm. So I ate far more than I really wanted to. And I think that really set me in very poor stead for the rest of my life. But of course, they were women who were expressing their love Absolutely. through the food that they created and got really upset when you appeared to be rejecting it. Yeah. So um, my children have never been forced to eat anything they didn't want. Um, they've always been fed freshly cooked, home cooked food, uh, which is something I didn't do for myself during the period when I was often alone in London because uh, in my forties, when women's hour moved to the morning as opposed to the afternoon and so my whole day was messed up i had to get up at five o'clock in the morning and you know at far too many croissants and drank too many latte um and i was here on my own for a large part of the week from monday to thursday and i didn't bother looking after myself as far as food was concerned at all i would get a takeaway I'd go down to the local supermarket and bring things that could just go in the microwave. I drank far too much dry white wine. I think an awful lot of us then treated dry white wine as if it were a non-alcoholic drink, as yeah. I think far too many women still do. Oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah, the whole wine o'clock thing, Ooh, yeah. very yeah. dangerous. And that's when I really started to put on weight. I got very low. I, I would say I got really quite depressed. You know, there was a whole period where the kids were coming into teenage, they were working very hard at school, my parents were getting elderly and ill, and I had all, the, you know, I was, I was the meat in the, in the sandwich, trying to deal with both ends of the family, and looking after myself very, very badly. 
Yeah, and that was true of university too, wasn't it? If, if we just can reflect on that chapter for a second. Um, and that was, you know, the chapter which says diet roller coaster. Um, you document your university years, uh, and this is particularly poignant for me because I went to the same university as we said before, and I did the same um, department, I was at the same department, but also I knew John Harris, the, the lecturer you mentioned, a dear, dear soul. Um, kind, he was my tutor. Yeah, uh, passionate about his Shakespeare and his Oriental theatre, but that's beside the point. Um, but you say in your book, I doubt I would have recovered from su such a dreadful state if it hadn't been for the pivotal intervention of my tutor, John Harris. Now, as a teacher, um, I'm acutely aware of the mental and physical well-being of my pupils. But it does take courage, doesn't it, to intervene the way that John did. And what are your thoughts on the role of teachers, but also influencers? which is a very topical thing now in this context? Well, we need to inform people about what's happening, that obesity is a disease, that it has very complicated origins. Um, and what happened in, in my case was, as happens to so many students who go to university, the first couple of terms, you eat a lot of stuff in the canteen, chips and other things that are not particularly good for you. Mm -hmm. um, you learn to drink because you go to the union bar and everybody's drinking and you go back to your student house or your room and you eat a lot of toast and that's exactly what happened to me. So I went from nine and a half to eleven and a half stone without and doing lots of exercise because in the drama department you know we had a dance teacher, we were dancing and exercising the whole time. Um, and I put on all that weight. And my father had been working in Turkey. My mother had been with him. They decided to come back. They drove across Europe and they picked up the ferry in Rotterdam to Hull. Good idea. She can come and meet us at the ferry and we'll go and see where she's living and what she's up to. So I go down and I'm standing there and my parents drove straight past me. And then my father suddenly slammed the brakes on, realising that actually that was me, because I was waving like crazy. And he jumped out of the car and flung his arms around me, delighted to see me. I got in the back of the car, my mother had not moved. And eventually she said, oh my God, what has happened to you? You look like a baby elephant. And she just went on and on and on and on about it. They didn't come to see where I was living. She just said, no, I just want to go home. So off they went. She rang me that evening. I'm just going to put the dog back. She rang me that evening to tell me that um, <clears throat> because I made such an upset, Dad had had a little prang in the car uh, in Selby. And... Um, he was clearly very displeased with me. So I went the next day to the health centre, the university health centre, and spoke to a young doctor and said, look, I need to lose weight. What can you do to help me? And he said, oh, I can give you some tablets. Uh, that'll help you. So off I went with my tablets and started taking them. And I'd also read about a diet um, in one of the magazines, you know, there were lots of diets in the magazines. And it, one of them said that a really good quick way of losing weight is to eat nothing but boiled eggs and tomatoes. Every meal, have one <laughs> boiled egg and one tomato. To this day, I could not face a plate that had a boiled egg and a tomato <laughs> on it. I can eat them separately, but I never want to see them together. And I went down to Seven Stone. Well, it was crazy. Mm. And I went into a tutorial with John and he said, Jenny, listen, we've got to talk about what's happening to you. He said, you have lost so much weight. You look quite ill and your work is slipping and you seem to be very upset a lot of the time. What drugs are you doing? And I was really <laughs> offended and said, drugs? I don't do drugs, John. I've never done any drugs, you know, I haven't even smoked a joint. 
And he said, well, you're taking something. What is it? And I said, only the pills the doctor gave me to help me lose weight. He said, show me what they are. Took them out of my bag. And he said, oh, God, God, they are black bombers. I didn't even know what a black bomber was. I'd never heard of them before. He said, they're really powerful amphetamines. Stop it now. And there you go, and I'm sure that's had some sort of long-term effect on my hormonal system as well. Um, and I had to go and stay in the health center for a couple of weeks and be fed gently and slowly. And then for the summer went home to my mother, who of course, the first thing she said to me when I got through the door was, oh my goodness, you've lost far too much weight. Yeah. I could never win with that woman. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I was, I really related to that. I, I too put weight on when I was at university and then, but, but, and happily for me, my mum was not, did not respond to you like that, to me like that. And I think, yeah, there were two comments that were thrown at you that stayed with me. And well, that was one of them, your mum's response to you, which I thought was heartbreaking. And the other one was from the stranger. We were at a formal dinner. <laughs> I can't, I can't Lord believe Lord Forte, yes, very well, posh dinner. I wasn't going to say his name, but... Uh, it, um, well, it was him. I have no... He you, he's not, he's not still alive, no. so I don't think we need to worry about that. No. But I was sitting, having dinner with him as one of the guests of honour at this dinner, and he said, um, you know, you could be really rather pretty if you, if you lost weight. <laughs> But I think you're getting rather fat or something, yeah, yeah. really fat. Yeah. It, it's amazing that people feel that they that that's a compliment in some way, you know. Exactly. It, yeah, it's very unfair. Exactly. Um, and another chapter which um, I just found difficult to read, really, because I felt almost voyeuristic in a way, and but also it gave me comfort in a strange way too was the one with what fat feels like. Um, and, you know, this is a very emotive chapter, um, looking at four women's experience of obesity. Um, Melissa, this, you know, the thing that sticks in my mind about that one was, I'm digging my grave with my spoon. And I just think that will stay with me, actually. You know? It, it, but that you know this is what is so vital i think about what's in this book it's got the science it it says here understand why this happens it's not necessarily the individual's fault in fact it's not at all the individual's fault and it's heartbreaking when you have this disease and it is a disease you know that even the prime minister at last has acknowledged it's a disease because the diets that I went on were just ridiculous. I've been on every diet known to woman. You know, I did the Atkins diet, I did the Ducan diet, I did the cabbage soup diet, I did the 5-2 diet, I did Weight Watchers, every single diet. And I would lose a lot of weight. And then suddenly I'd think, oh, well, I, you know, I've I've got to where I want to be. I, I can start eating a bit more normally now. Um, and I was ravenously hungry. And what I learned when I started to study the science was what happens when we go on these kind of diets and lose lots of weight is a hormone called leptin goes rushing up to our brain and says, oh, quick, quick, she's starving, she's starving, make her eat, make her eat. Mm. And it's our metabolic system that makes us eat more probably than we even had before. And only 5% of people who go on that kind of diet, and gosh, I admire and envy them, are people who can sustain it. And they sustain it because they think about it every minute of every day. I remember when I did Weight Watchers, the woman who was my supporter said, look, you know, you can eat spaghetti, but what you have to do is you, you take it out of the packet and you, you hold it up like this and you you see if it fits on a 5p piece and then that's the amount you can have. And I remember thinking, am I going to spend the rest of my life measuring my spaghetti to see if when dry 
mm. it sits on a five pence piece or weighing every little piece of cheese that I might fancy. And I couldn't, I just found that incredibly difficult, but some people manage it. But that also means that 95% of us who go on those diets put the weight all back on and more. Yeah, I know it is a, it's a constant battle. The, um, the, there's, one, there's another thing that I, I stood out for me and that was when you say how not to damage your child's confidence. And I looked through them and I probably have done all of them, if I'm really honest. And I'm a very loving mother, um, as my children will tell you. <laughs> but I did feel really guilty when I looked. But I mean, you say, never criticize your child's size. Well, I haven't really done that, to be honest, but not really. Um, never force feed, I've definitely done that. Finish off what you, you know. Um, and feed them everything. Um, but in small portions. I think that's okay. I think I did that one. Um, we should know all these things, shouldn't we? But we often don't acknowledge them. I mean, it's ingrained in us, I guess. I, there's something about mothering, I think, that makes us completely obsessed <laughs> with how much food our children are getting. I mean, what's the first thing that happens after you've had a baby? They weigh it. Yes. And they tell you what it weighs. And then regularly you have to go to the clinic to have it weighed and make sure that it's putting on weight. And that's ingrained right from the start. So is it any wonder we become completely obsessed? Oh my goodness, are we giving them the right kind of food? Are we giving them enough food? Are they getting a little bit fat around the middle? I mean, one of mine... Um, I don't think he'll mind me saying this because he's 37 now and he's beyond caring about these things and he's gorgeous and slim as is the other one. Um, but he went through a period when he was at grammar school when they started weighing boys regularly and we had a letter saying he was considered overweight. And I <laughs> went in high dudgeon to see the high master um, and said, look, uh, this is ridiculous. You've, you've taken his weight now and maybe it is a little over what you think it should be. I said, but in six months time, he'll have shot up to six feet and he'll have lost all the weight. His pattern of growth, which I had actually measured very carefully, was to get a little bit chubby, shoot up, lose it all, get a little bit chubby again and shoot up. And he finally did shoot up to six foot two and was perfectly fine. So I, I think, you know, at, at that time during teenage, parents have to be really, really careful. If your child is clearly becoming obese, then you have to do something about it. And that may be, you know, one of the things that really struck me when I was writing this book was the way... The, the food that's provided in very poor areas is often so terrible. I can't remember exactly what the expression was, it's in the, in the book somewhere, but it was that, you know, there are fish and chip shops, burger shops, kebab shops, mm. all around poor areas where kids go and buy cheap food, which is not doing them any good at all. Mm. Um, it, you know, I, I wish we had domestic science, you know, that terribly old fashioned terminology, domestic science in schools, so that parents learn how to cook well at home and cheaply. It's no more expensive to, to buy fresh food and cook it than it is to buy junk that's full of salt and sugar and rubbish. Um, so we do have to be really, because, you know, obesity among children is really serious. And the first person I had a conversation with about the possibility of the surgery that I had was actually a, a young metabolic surgeon from University College Hospital in London. I met him on Woman's Hour talking about teenage obesity. And he was carrying out the kind of operation that I had at the age of 65 on teenagers because their obesity was so worrying. So it, 
it, we have to be careful to try and prevent it happening in the first place if we possibly can with but accept that it is a disease that some of us will suffer from and you know when i had a when i had breast cancer and i had my breast removed in a mastectomy nobody said oh my god should the nhs have been spending all that money on uh, giving you treatment for your cancer but when it's weight loss surgery as it's seen people would say oh i'm not sure the nhs should be spending money on fat lazy people we're not fat we're lazy we're suffering from a disease and that surgery was my fat chance yeah well thank you for that and you finish your book in a really positive way i love the way you end it, in a positive way um bringing everything back to your little dogs and um, using them as, a, as an analogy um the advice you quote from your friend susie um orbach which says beauty comes in many sizes and then you talk about your little your little doggies in the park and and, and i thought that i've retold that story to my husband and to my daughter and they both got it you know and it was lovely well so, yeah you've seen madge she's the tiniest littlest one ridiculously tiny actually uh, and then there's frida she's a little bit bigger but still small and then there's butch he's the only boy in the family and he's the size of a of a, of a jack russell really you know he's he's quite big and i think he has a genetic history of overeating as well because uh, <laughs> he's a bit big on the fat side so we're walking through the park we do that all the time people always stop us oh, aren't they gorgeous oh they're so sweet oh they're so lovely but what breed are they i say that they're all chihuahuas and they say oh they're the same breed but they're such different sizes and i look at them and say well you know we're the same breed but i'm bigger than you or very rarely, I managed to say, you're bigger than me. <laughs> Thank you, Jenny. And, and I really do recommend this book. I, I think it's, it's a great read. And, and I just didn't put it down over the weekend. It was great. Thank um, you. And uh, I look forward to your next book with Ooh. anticipation, whatever that may be. So thank you ever so much. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye. Thank you so much to Fliss and to Jenny for that lovely interview. We've got a lovely stash of these uh, these books, all signed by Jenny. We uh, we drove down to her house, social distance in her garden, and uh, she signed uh, two or three dozen copies of the book. So do pop in and, uh, and and grab yours when you can, or give us a call on 01442 827 653. All the other purchase blurb is in the text below this video. Thank you so much for watching this one. We've got dozens uh, of, uh, of interviews lined up to do. We've done dozens already. So do look at our YouTube channel and, uh, and have a look at those and subscribe as well. So thank you very much and we'll see you next time.